Okay. Is the microphone on? I think it is. Good. Hey, thank you, Leo. I always got to give a second for my eyes to adjust. <laughs> I feel like we're sitting in the dark. All right. Good morning. So good to see each of you here today. Uh, we're going to be picking up in Acts chapter 4 in just a moment. I'm going to do my best to remember the slides this time uh, when we go through here. I don't know if the slides are enabled now. Can we go and flip through them? Maybe not yet. So I'd like to, us to just take a look at this. Uh, oh, we got a security alert. Take a look at our, our at least let's, let's recite our memory verse we've been uh, reciting this month from Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we've been talking a little bit about some memory tools we can use to help us remember the various uh, chapter subject matter, uh, just to give us a little bit better uh, recall of the things we've been studying. And so these are the first four, uh, what we're calling ABCs. Uh, A for the ascension and apostle chosen. Uh, B for beginning of the church. C for cripple cured. And D for determined disciples. And we're going to find out a lot more about their determination uh, today in response to what occurred last week in our class. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, this outline that we've been kind of keeping together based on our key passage in Acts 1 verse 8. Outline of the text, we're going through this quarter and the next quarter. Uh, the first seven chapters of Acts is the gospel in Jerusalem. Uh, 8 through 12 is the gospel in Judea and Samaria. And then 13 through the remainder of the, of the book, the gospel to the other most parts of the world. Uh, so we're going to be studying those key divisions as we go through. Right now we're in chapter 4, which is really a section about some opposition and persecution endured by the disciples. What miracle was performed in Acts chapter 3? Just as a, a sense of review here for us, what, what miracle was performed in Acts chapter 3? We're talking about this memory tool, the cripple cured, kind of gives you a clue as to what was there, right? What happened uh, in Acts chapter 3? Yeah, Richard? A lame man was healed. Yeah, a lame man was healed. who had been lame since birth. And after the miracle is performed, we read in Acts 3.11, Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So they came together having recognized this as a miracle that occurred. And they're all in this section that Stu pointed out to us uh, last week. There that's Solomon's portico. And so they're all standing there at this portico, as was shown last week. Uh, Peter then goes forth and preaches a sermon, including the three main points that he covered last week. The suffering servant being Jesus, Jesus the prophet of prophecy, Jesus the seed of Abraham. So that is kind of where we left off last week as far as uh, the, the events that we're, we're kind of picturing. And so we're going to pick up with Acts chapter 4 today. Uh, this has just happened, uh, what was discussed last week, and let's go ahead and read Acts 4, 1 through 4 together, kind of get our minds back into where we are in, this, in the text. So it says, now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So who came upon Peter, John, and why did they do that? And what did they do to them? This was the first question in the book that we handed out. Yeah. So, so the local authorities came. Uh, these were the ones who were recognized as having authority there in the temple. Uh, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. They laid hands on them, put them in custody until the next day. When it says laid hands on them, it, what, is that a friendly gesture? No. No, no they're, they're arresting these people. This is, this is as uh, you know, Jerome described, this is, this is like police enforcement. You know, they're coming to enforce the, the, uh, their, their rule. This is the first recorded persecution that is encountered by the apostles. And notice who it was at the hands of. It's not at the hands of the Roman government. It was by the Jews. 
And we're going to see much more persecution leveled by the Jews towards Christians in the early years of Christianity. And later we're going to see other local conflicts that occur, loss of idol manufacturing revenue, desire to maintain power, uh, and then followed by oppression by the Roman government later on. So think to yourself and what you know about the scriptures, why might the Sadducees have been particularly prone to taking offense at the teaching that was going on? Matthew? Because they're preaching the resurrection of Jesus. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They kind of centered their lives around, we're going to get the most out of the here and now. They compromised with the Romans, paid off the Romans to get positions of power, uh, like the high priest. Uh, so you know, there is a resurrection of the dead, and they're ultimately going to be held accountable after that, then that kind of threatens their way of life in the present. Yeah, it's, it's unraveling their whole you know, key philosophy and their teaching that they have in this particular sect. We know this in Matthew 22, 23. It says, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him. We, just, we know that from the scriptures. They say there is no resurrection there. Uh, Peter and John were teaching the people in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This was directly counter to their belief and, and that there is no resurrection. So, yes, yeah, Stu? After AD 70 and the temple destroyed, the Sadducee and the sect disappeared. It was so centered around the temple, what Matthew was describing, the political appointees, the high priest in, in name only, uh, the, the, the relationship with the rulers, that it completely disappeared. So you never hear about it again after that. It was so focused around the temple, the money changers, and the financial side. That's how central this, this doctrine was to them. Uh, Stu points out that after AD 70, the Sadducees are essentially just never heard from again. They just go into a, a, a time in which they don't exist. Uh, everything they centered their beliefs around no longer was, was available to them. Uh, did you notice how the message of the passage here uh, and the, at the end, the gospel and its power to save souls... It was not stopped by the authorities. It didn't stop. We're told many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So for for me, I'm I'm always looking for some sort of application to myself. What can I learn from these things as I read them? It's not just historical fact for us to read. We're supposed to learn and make some sort of application as best we can from what we read. And I, I ask myself, would I be bold enough to teach the gospel despite being arrested? Would I, would I be bold enough to do that? Uh, there are people arrested around this world for their beliefs uh, in Christianity and are taken into custody and threatened and harmed. Uh, there are people living in harm's way each and every day just for professing they believe in Christ. So would I be bold enough? Would you be bold enough? If you were arrested, I'm going to keep teaching the gospel. I think to myself about the drastic limits being placed on free speech in Canada, England, and here in the United States. And I think to myself, it could happen here. We're not uh, immune to those types of situations. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12, and see what came to pass after this section here. So, and it came to pass on the next day. So they've been been in prison overnight. They've been in jail, uh, Peter and John. And it says, on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, By what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you, builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." Well, right here, they demonstrate the answer to the question I just asked. They were bold enough to preach the gospel while under arrest and being questioned. So on this next day, uh, 
the, el- the rulers, elders, scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together. And this would have typically been referred to as, as the Sanhedrin that's coming together for a meeting. Uh, verse 5 lists three groups that made up the Sanhedrin, which was the highest court of the Jews. So they convened on the day after the arrest of Peter and John to consider that case. The elders were men of age and influence who were selected to sit on the court. The scribes were literally professional teachers and students of the scriptures. <clears throat> Verse 6 lists Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many of, uh, that were of the kindred of the high priest. Having described in detail, uh, well, excuse me, described in general terms the members of the court, Luke now mentions some of the most distinguished ones in particular, it seems. Uh, the high priest presided over the Sanhedrin. Annas is described as the high priest, even though the Roman governor had deposed him from that position in AD 15. For even though the Romans no longer recognized him as high priest, the Jews continued to honor him with that title, as well as considerable prestige and power. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. He was presently recognized by the Roman authorities as high priest, occupying that office uh, historically, we know, from AD 18 to about AD 36. We don't know much about the identities of John and Alexander. They must have been prominent figures among the Jews, uh, but we don't know much more about them. So Peter and John, it says they were set in the midst of the council, according to Acts 4-7. And so in just looking at kind of how this worked historically, by what I can read, it was the practice of the Sanhedrin to sit in a semicircle so they could see one another as well as the prisoners who are on trial. Um, And they would be stood in the center of the semicircle. And if you'll remember, Jesus had warned the apostles they would find themselves in these kinds of situations if you look passages like Mark 13, 9. So I want to ask you a question. I, I thought that Peter and John were arrested for preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That seemed like what they were arrested for. So why are these people asking them by what power or by what name have you done this? I, th- I thought that's not why they were arrested. But I, why, why would that be the question now? Why would... They were teaching on the temple premises. Yes, they were teaching on the temple premises. Sure. So why would they have asked by what power, by what name have you done this? Possibly. Yeah, Matthew. Than just the Sadducees. Now you've got Pharisees involved. They're not, they're not, the resurrection is fine with them. They're happy with that. Uh, but, you know, saying Jesus, this guy we've been trying to be killed, they didn't like what he was saying, he didn't, you know, he threatened our power structure, saying that he's alive and he's still got power, that's a problem for all of them. I believe that's probably the case. We don't know for sure, but that seems to make sense. Uh, the councils made up predominantly of Pharisees uh, who did believe in the resurrection, as Matthew just stated. So the questioning by the leadership would have been focused on things that were outside of that initial reaction by the Sadducees. They were asking here about the miracle that was performed in Acts 3. That's what was prompting, okay, by what power or by what name have you done this? What is the this? It's the miracle that you performed. How, what, by what power did you do it? Uh, yes, dude. Oh, they did not dispute that it was done. I think that's interesting as well. There is no dispute that the miracle took place. So what were the key points Peter made when given the opportunity to answer? And notice his boldness, you know, by by the power of Jesus of Nazareth. This man stands before you whole. He's pointing out it's it's irrefutable. He's been healed. Uh, You crucified Jesus by whose authority the apostles healed this lame man. So the one you ask, the one who healed this man is the one that I do this by his authority. God raised Jesus from the dead. And then he goes on and says, he is the stone that you builders cast aside. But Jesus has been made the chief cornerstone of the building, just as the prophets foretold. So what is a chief cornerstone Uh, That's not something that we possibly use very often unless we're in architecture or building or talking about structures. This cornerstone idea, it is the rock upon which the weight of the entire structure rests. It is the cornerstone. Um, So in this idea, Scripture really describes Jesus as that chief cornerstone of our faith. As the chief cornerstone, Jesus ensures the stability of, 
of the whole system of our salvation. Jesus was and he is the only way to obtain salvation. It is only through him. Jesus refers to himself as the chief cornerstone during his ministry on earth, even when he's speaking to the chief priests and scribes in Luke 20, verse 17. He refers to himself as that. It would be difficult for me, that, for me to understand that they would mistake what Peter's telling them. Uh, Jesus refers to himself this way as the chief cornerstone. Uh, he says uh, in Luke 20, verse 17, uh, then he looked at them and said, what then is that that is written, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they fear the people, for they know he had spoken this parable against them. I find it interesting that it's a similar scenario. They want to arrest Jesus, but they couldn't because of the people. Ultimately, that will be the reason why these people also do not lay hold of and punish Peter and John the way that they intend to. So Peter, the same one who preaches this message on this day, as recorded in Acts 4, uses the same illustration uh, when he writes in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10, talking about the chief cornerstone. He says in verse 6 of 1 Peter 2, Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. It's just, it's a, it's a common ref reference to Jesus. And there is no salvation in any other except Jesus. This is what Jesus told his disciples about himself. You remember John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you had a comment, I think. We got it. So think about just the similarities here. It's a, common, it's a common unified message that's being preached. So how is this message so contrary to what we hear in much of the world today? Is this the same message we hear everywhere we go? Or is it different? And how is it different? Yeah, Richard. Well, foundationally, that cornerstone is the most important part of the structure. Yeah. And so if people build their faith on something besides the most important part, it's going to fall apart. It's, it's not going to be uh, directed in the way that the cornerstone would have to be directed. And so it's, it's not going to stand up. That's right. It's going to fall apart. As Richard's talking about here, you take the, the cornerstone out of the equation, the building will crumble. It's not going to stand. So without Jesus as the cornerstone of our faith, whatever we choose to believe in will crumble. It has to be based on Jesus as the cornerstone. What do you hear in opposition to that kind of belief and doctrine that Jesus is the only way? There are many roads. <laughs> I hear that too. There are all roads lead to heaven. There are many ways to please God. There are, there are many ways that one can worship God or please Him or serve Him or even receive salvation. <clears throat> and it seems that as though there are almost seemingly thousands of ways to be saved, but yet Jesus says there's one. The Bible says salvation is only by the authority of Jesus. We should never forget how much that our faith depends upon that chief cornerstone. That is the, the foundation of our faith. Let's look at Acts uh, 4, verse 13. Acts 4, verse 13. <clears throat> now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council... They conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we uh, have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, 
finding no way of punishing him because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So we're told here the council saw the boldness of Peter and John. And I find it interesting here because just a few weeks before, Peter, Peter was so afraid of this assembly, he denied that he even knew Jesus was crucified. You remember? This is the same people. These are the same people. There is no hesitation now on Peter's part to proclaim Jesus as the Christ to anyone who's going to listen, even when being threatened. So I would, I would propose to you and myself that boldness in the gospel is not a personality type. It's a decision. And it's one that's based on conviction and our faith. So who made the claims made by Peter and John hard to deny by those who had arrested him? Well, the man that's standing right there next to him, he's right here, he's whole. You can't deny what really happened here. And what did the council decide to do? Let's, let's take a break. <laughs> we need to confer with each other. We gotta figure this out. And instead of taking it at face value, they needed to confer. What, what strikes you as odd about the conversation, if anything, uh, about the conversation the council had with each other as to what they're going to do. Is there anything odd about this conversation that's happening in this, this little, you know, hey, we're going to, hey, you know, Peter, John, you can be excused. We're going to have our own little meeting here. What's odd about what they're talking about and how they discuss it? <laughs> Pretty sure there's some horse trading going on. Well, well, yeah. So it, it, it's obvious, obvious that a, a miracle had, been, had happened. Mm -hmm. And then these men are speaking, uneducated men are speaking with boldness and saying things that were probably resonating in their heads with their history in, in Judaism. They basically probably should have just said, you know what, you're right. But they couldn't say that. Why, why couldn't they say that, though? They didn't like the answer. Peter gave them the answer to their question. Why didn't they like that answer? <laughs> this is it's, it's their, their pride is standing in their way what, are, what do they have to lose if they agree with this well just like today they're going to lose their influence they're going to lose their power yeah. uh, they're going to eventually they're going to lose uh, possibly their wealth because they are now proclaiming Jesus as the apostle now they knew the miracle took place. It's not a matter of, hey, did it take place? It's what are we going to do about this? Because everybody knows it happened. How are we going to paint this picture different? How are we going to cover this up? How are we going to you know, push this in a different way that we can deny what really happened here and, and still retain ourselves? It says we cannot deny it. What, was, what were they trying to, to really cause to happen with Peter and John? From now on, they don't want anybody to say anything about this name, Jesus, again. We've got to squash this. It wasn't that this was, this was falsehood. They're squashing truth. They're squashing truth. So they knew a miracle had taken place. It was evident to everybody. Should this undeniable miracle have caused them to pause and consider? They did pause and consider, but they considered how to circumvent they didn't consider the real possibility of what this means, what they should believe about this. Why didn't they listen to the message spoken by Peter when they knew an undeniable miracle had taken place? They were not open. They were not open to receiving truth. Their minds were made up. They would have to admit guilt. They would have to admit, we did crucify the Savior. They would have to admit that they're learning the truth from uneducated men, from untrained men. We're learning from these people. That's pride that Jimmy was talking about. Hey, we, we can't be taught something by someone who's beneath us. Their positions of authority would be undermined as the old law would have been fulfilled. They would lose their status. They don't want this. They don't want the truth. They were trying to keep the truth from being taught. You had your hand. So I, I try to breathe a little bit of emotion into it that helps me make it more real. Um, instead of just 
people and history and all that kind of thing. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall behind the scenes after they have this this council right, gathering right here. The anger that they had probably was, and it probably started well beyond before them when Jesus was on earth and then right about the time Lazarus died, it's very similar. Then they're like, well, what are we going to do? We either got to get rid of Lazarus or we got to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to kill him too. We got to figure out one or the other because we can't, we can't have this, this person who's now a walking, talking, breathing example of Jesus' power. And then that level stayed up pretty high. And then they, like I said, they thought they squished it. But, I mean, they've got to be so angry right now because now this is the first time that they've gathered, right? And had a council or come, come to About this, yes. Mm-hmm. Last the first time since Jesus. And so, like, what in the world? What is happening? This is still going on. And they're performing miracles that they cannot deny that are unbelievable. And they have to be so angry right now. So I'm, I'm certain anger was being demonstrated there, felt at least. Uh, could we be tempted or even guilty of not considering certain parts of God's word for the same reasons? Have we ever said to ourselves, I can't learn something from Scripture from this person teaching. He's less experienced. He's young. He, he's not been a Christian very long. Are we putting our faith in the man who's teaching or in the gospel that's being taught? Uh, have we ever been challenged on how we think about something, how it ought to be with regard to it being right or wrong? I have. I've been challenged. Is our response that we just write them off, say, ah, you're just, you're just being so strict, or it doesn't fit with what I want to do? You, I've, I've already worked through that before. I've already thought through this. I already have this all figured out. I already have my own conviction over it. I don't need to reexamine this. They have their own convictions, right? They have convictions they believed in. Are, are we afraid of having to admit that we understood something incorrectly or that we're wrong about something? I think those are the dangers. Those are the temptations we can fall into where we may ignore truth right in front of our face, ignore the, the power we see witnessed in the Scriptures, ignore what it says because it's going to require that I have to change. I have to admit something I've done wrong. I have to have humility. That, that's what the Word requires of all of us is humility, a contrite heart. Dan? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we think about this, we talk about these kind of situations that we might face. More often than not, we're faced with a challenge that has to do with some aspect of our faith, some, you know, some small piece of our faith, whether it's marriage or divorce, whether it's eldership, whatever it may be. We need to understand these people were not being challenged one small piece of what they were They were being challenged with the ultimate foundation of everything. It, was, it wasn't just some one tenet. It wasn't just one doctrine they were being argued. It was the, the entire foundation of everything they believed being shaken. And it would be like us being challenged to be completely different in our faith that for example, we wouldn't believe in Christ anymore. There'd be some other path of salvation. And that's what they were being challenged to do. And so we, it, it's hard to imagine the level of change required. And many of the other this, and that goes on, we see some of them eventually, mm-hmm. eventually do abandon and, and, and turn to Jesus. But it, it's just a monumental thing that, that they're being challenged with. It's definitely a challenge. It's definitely a challenge for them. Yet God expected them to listen. He expected them to listen. He expected them to understand that truth. He had prepared the old covenant for that very reason, to bring them about to this understanding. God had made all the preparatory steps uh, to make it as easy for them to adopt what his plan was as he could. Um, Whatever is revealed in God's truth, we must conform we must conform. Um, whether or not someone came from a background that's based in Islam, it's demanded that they have a contrite heart, understand the truth about Jesus as the Son of God and not merely a man who was a prophet. There's, there's things that this word is going to require of, of people in order to accept and change. Uh, the word is not intended to be bent. 
You know, we see this Peter himself writes uh, through inspiration, 2 Peter 3, uh, verse 16, warning that there are those which will uh, twist the scriptures to their own destru- destruction. And we, we do not want to be of that type uh, in this. Let's look at this next question. What was the council's command to Peter and John? What did they command them? And what was Peter and John's reply to the council's command? <laughs> what did they tell them? Yeah. Not to speak in the name of Jesus. Don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. And what was Peter and John's reply? Fat chance. He says fat chance. They were, they were more eloquent uh, <laughs> in this. <laughs> Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So we're not going to accept that. We're not going to accept that. Do you feel like you're told to stop teaching or preaching in Jesus' name in certain situations? Do you feel that way? It may not be through direct command, but through peer pressure, influence, those kind of things. Sometimes we face those challenges in smaller ways. We're not directly commanded not to do it by the authority, but we're kind of told to keep our mouth shut about what we believe in in other areas. Uh, I I know that, I mean, I've said this before years ago, but, you know, Medicare requires that a a provider not speak about religion in the care of a patient unless they bring it up first, at least for an independent uh, IDTF like I operate. So that's that's against the law uh, for for us to speak of those things unless they ask. Can't do that. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, lawful, um, there's just ways that we're pinched. We're kind of we're kind of squeezed, um, you know. So I think we're going to feel this more. We might even be commanded to stop stop teaching about, um, you know, homosexuality is sinful. One day it may be commanded uh, that that not be taught. And what are we going to do? Hey, you judge what you think. We're going to keep teaching the truth. We're going to keep teaching what God said for us to teach. We're not, going to, we're not going to just pare it down. So at this point, the council found no way to punishment, punish them. So they let them go because of the people. Because what were they doing? What were all the people doing at this point regarding the miracle? They're praising God. They're glorifying it. This man is walking. He's, he's been lame for 40 years. This is great. Look what God has done. They're, they're not just saying, look what, John, what Peter and John did. They're glorifying God for it. They're giving God so they understand who was responsible for it. The excitement and glory given to God was still going on. It's not like it stopped. It was still happening. So let's look at Acts 4.23. Acts 4.23 It says, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The king, kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So their company, uh, it says they go back, they report this to their companions. It's not specifically identified who the companions were. However, I think we can deduce that Peter and John returned to the other apostles there. There were over 5,000 men or, or, that were saints, so it would be thousands more, I would think, including women and, uh, that, that had obeyed the gospel. Uh, I think it's very unlikely they would have gathered with all of the disciples at one time there at this time uh, it was the apostles who were doing all the preaching the working of miracles at this time so that would match up with what is being prayed in this prayer and it would make sense that this company to which peter and john returned was composed of those who were directly involved 
with them in this work. Uh, I, when I read their prayer, well, we'll talk about that in a moment, but when I read their prayer, it, it seems as though that the apostles that were being reported to are essentially praying for those who were Peter and John, praying for them who had endured this. And in in my estimation, it seems as though they are emboldened. All of the apostles are now emboldened with this being filled with the Holy Spirit to speak with boldness. It wasn't just going to be Peter and John that were going to be speaking with boldness. All the apostles are going to speak with boldness now. And and they, they, they really were identified as these are the ones who are speaking in boldness in, in Jesus' name and teaching. So what do the disciples pray for? We look at question number three. They pray together. You predicted this was going to happen. This is what happened. Uh, you predict the Gentiles, the kings, would oppose your anointed one. And surely they did oppose the anointed one. And it came to pass, just as you said it would, in this very city, we see, Lord, what's happened. This is exactly what's happening. Uh, they're asking God to be aware of their threats, to help them to have boldness as they preach, as they should. And while they continue to show miracles um, in, in the, the teaching as they're going about, I wanted to ask you the question, what might you have prayed for in their situation? <laughs> what would you have prayed for if you were there? Please keep us out of prison. Uh, provide us safety from the oppressors. Protect my family. That's not what they prayed for at all. It's, it, to me, I find that very unique. They're not asking for God to help them physically save them from any of these things. Their focus was on continuing to reveal the truth to others. And it seemed to re- dis- kind of disregard the treatment they were going to endure. They asked for strength to overcome their fear. That's what they were asking for. I, I think that that's a good pattern. That's a good pattern. We can ask God for strength. Ask Him to help us with our fears, to overcome fears. Um, Provide for His Word to be spread. That's ultimately what God wants is for all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. That's God's mission. And we just play a very small part in that, but we need to play our part and move forward with it. Any comments on this section before we move on? Yeah, Matthew? I think it's interesting that they're specifically asking God to perform those miracles, not let us have the power to confirm this, but there's a direct recognition that this is all God, and it's all through the name of Jesus, and they're not involved in that. Yes, these were not, these were not, um, you know, supernaturals. Uh, The apostles were men. All of this was being worked by God's power, and I, I don't see any record of Peter you know, praying right before he spoke, say, okay, give me the words to say, God gave him. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke to the Sanhedrin there. He spoke to the council. I think they're praying for God. Continue to help, continue to guide us. Continue to help us in these situations. Continue to display your power. I love that. Your, it's, it's his power. It's not their own. Uh, they recognize where that power came from as well. Stu? They, they had to recognize the change in themselves. Yeah. Just a few weeks before, they were that. That word in Greek is where we get the word idiots from. They're untrained. They're ungrammared. And they see it. They want that to continue. They want to see the progress of the gospel. That Holy Spirit that confirmation is what's allowing them to have that spread. Yes, totally. That This Holy Spirit confirmation is allowing them to speak in a way that is revealing the truth in its, in its completeness and with boldness. They want that to continue. Let's look at Acts 4.32. Acts 4.32 it says, Now the multitude, so we're kind of switching gears here. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. How were the needy saints uh, there, the Christians, relieved? How were their needs met? Um, Communally. Well, tell me more specifically, what was done? 
sharing. What did they have to do to have something to share? Sell their possessions. They had to sell stuff. They had to sell their land. And we're not talking about, hey, I'm going I'm to sell this goat. It says they're selling houses and property, things that we might say have great value. Voluntary giving of one's possessions to satisfy the needs of the brethren there. All who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed each one as anyone had need. Why do you think there may have been needy Christians there in Jerusalem at that time, maybe more so than might normally have been expected that to, to be witnessed there? Matthew? Well, uh, in chapter 2, we saw there were a bunch of people in town for Pentecost. Yes. People are not from there, they don't have a job there, they're not earning money there, they're just there for the feast, then they're converted, and they stick around because at that point that's where the church is, and now they don't have any income. Yeah, great, so there's a lot of people there converted to Christ, a lot of people gather for Pentecost, they stuck around, think about it, wouldn't you want to stick around? I don't have, like, okay, I just became a Christian, what, what does all this mean? The apostles are the ones that have the Holy Spirit. That's, this is where I'm going to get the truth. It's not as if, well, hey, we're handing out Bibles. You can go take the... This wasn't written yet. The New Testament wasn't there. So they, they were craving the truth. They wanted to hear what they, what they needed to do. This was a very unusual situation uh, at this time. So these new believers, I believe, had chosen to prolong their stay in Jerusalem beyond what they had originally intended. They, I'm sure they made preparations, but they didn't prepare to stay this long. And so there's need now. And I think this is a good example for us to understand the communal nature the, of the church treasury, so to speak. That's how what we call those kind of things, getting, pooling our resources together as a church and distributing to the needs of those among the brethren who may need them. Uh, for me, I ask myself, would I be willing to sell stuff if my family were in need? Yes. Would I be willing to sell stuff if my brethren were in need? They're not my family. They're people from out of town. They're new Christians. It's not like my Christian brother I've known for 20 years. It's a Christian maybe who's been a Christian for weeks, days. Would I be willing to say, you know what? The apostles said there's a need. I need to figure out what I can do to help these brethren. This is more important than my stuff. Well, this is going to be a big hardship on me. Am I willing to do it? Am I willing to sell stuff to help my brother in need here? That's just a question you've got to answer for yourself uh, and myself. How can studying the courage of Peter and John help you serve God? How can this help you serve God? This study today. Yeah. I'm impressed when you read uh, the book of 1 John, the very opening, it talks about the, the essentially close to being bold. And maybe we had just the things that we saw, things that we taught, touched, things that we witness we are compelled to to give those to other people mm -hmm. and i think about this do i have that same attitude where i feel compelled because of the grace that's given to me do i feel pressure yeah. obligation the compulsion like they did to share that? yeah when we read this phrase in verse 33 and great grace was upon them all have you ever been helped by a brother in christ physically tell you what when that happens and someone sacrifices to help you boy it sure does sure does encourage you to see God's love through that other person doesn't it if you've been helped in some way you can kind of see what this means it's not so much about the stuff it's about what's motivating the gift that you love that person that much you love the brethren that much. You love the Lord that much that you'd part with something that you could benefit from in this life to help them. There was great grace upon them all. <clears throat> what was motivating this grace? What was motivating it in these people? What had they just received? <laughs> they, had, they had received their salvation. The apostles had received the Holy Spirit, spread the word. They received their salvation. They had been saved from their sins. They had been exposed to a love from God such as they had never experienced before. Well, 
Well, and some of these, I'm certain, were those that were shouting, crucify Him. This had not happened that long ago. And now they could be in fellowship with God? It's a huge shift. 180 degrees. They received something that was greater of greater value to them than anything they possessed physically. Someone else had their hand raised. Richard? Yeah, these people were familiar with the blood sacrifice. These people were familiar with what cost sin brought upon them. So, as you just pointed out, there would be many of them there that witnessed the crucifixion of Christ and knew what that meant now. Now they do. And that, that sacrifice brought upon them salvation. Yeah. It's a, it's a great motivator. What else in the study of the courage of Peter and John will help you serve God today? Yeah. Well, circling back to something that you said at the beginning that just really kind of struck me. You said that, um, let me read it. Boldness in the gospel isn't a personality trait, it's a decision. These were unskilled and untrained men. I mean, they, were, they weren't known for being bold or having this courage and this, this uh, teaching. Yet they didn't let that hold them back. And I think a lot of times I want to say, well, you know, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. Yet they didn't say that. If they would have said, well, you know, maybe it should be someone else, the gospel would have never spread. And it's the same thing with us. If we aren't going to be bold with the people we know or the people that we meet, the gospel's not going to be spread. So yeah, no one's going to hear it. You know, think about this. The Holy Spirit baptism was not a possession of their will. Peter still had to choose to stand up. He started to rely on the Holy Spirit to give him the words, but he had to say them. The Holy Spirit wasn't forcing him to do something. He was choosing. As we'll see in later times, Timothy was encouraged to use the gift that he was given. He had to choose to use it. Um, this was a bold move for Peter. And imagine what he had overcome, as we spoke about a few moments ago. He had denied the Christ three times. And yet here he was in a situation where he'd have to proclaim Jesus Christ before the people that could stone him officially, take care of this, remove him. So I, I also learned from this that I should expect to suffer. <laughs> it, it should be an expectation that I'm going to have to sacrifice something. I'm going to have to suffer something, whether it's you know suffering from, you know, a brother needs something and I'm, I'm going to have lack of sleep. Uh, whether it's suffering where I'm going to have to do without something. Whether it's suffering that I'm going to have to do something that I don't want to do and I don't get to do what I want to do now. I, you know, oh, I really wanted to do this today, but my brother needs me now. I'm going to have to suffer. Is that suffering? It is a little, but I may have to really suffer for my, for my beliefs too. I may have to be put in front of a people and have to profess what I believe in. I may have to suffer. And why would I do that? Because God gave me salvation and Jesus is worth it. And Jesus suffered and he suffered as an example for me to follow that I have to be willing to sacrifice something for others. Also, and I'll get to you in just a second, I should pray for courage. I should pray for courage to do his will. I should pray the way they did. I should be praying bold prayers to ask God to give me courage to do his will um, and that be the focus of my prayers. Not so much to preserve me physically, but to do His will and to sacrifice what it takes to do His will. Those should be some of the focal points of some of my prayers. Yeah. To go back to Peter, um, have, I don't know if you ever missed out on an opportunity or um, yes. something and it just, it just tore you up inside. Well, um, I try to put myself in his shoes where he's at speaking boldly and think back to when he wasn't speaking boldly just before and what he felt like in that moment. And if it, I mean, what, I've been there, not, not in that situation, but I'm, where I'm like, that will never, ever happen again. That's happened to me too. I've missed opportunities. Again, I'll make sure that I will do whatever it takes to make that not happen again. The, the angst and the, the sorrow that he probably felt, I mean, it's, it's almost like nauseating just thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I wanted to say was you're talking about those that were giving to people that they hadn't met. Well, you, you 
raised a good point I never thought about all the people that were staying in Jerusalem. And that was a huge sacrifice for them to leave maybe everything they knew to stay there for the truth. Mm -hmm. So these people that were giving, they were having a lot of the same joy for the Lord that those other people were having, just in a different way. And mm -hmm. giving to people they've never really met. And so understanding that is, is interesting, but in talking about it is one thing now. Uh, doing it now, that's, that's, that's what we have to apply. That's the hard part. And it was free will. These, were not compo these, these people weren't compelled. These are free will gifts. That's what God expects from us, voluntary giving. And Stu is going to get into the scenario uh, uh, you know, next week uh, about kind of more along the lines of what that looks like and what our motivation should be for those gifts. And, and also that things are within our power that things that we have remain in our power until we part with them and allow them to be used by the congregation to be benevolent gifts to others if they're given that way. Uh, any other final comments before we're dismissed? Yes, sir. You mentioned the sacrifices. Uh, here we see actually Jesus' words back in Luke 18, mm. 29, uh, 30 fulfilled about you know, people who have left family or uh, possessions, homes, for the sake of the gospel are going to receive many times as much mm. in present age. And now we see that's what's happening. You know, now they have this huge family, even though they may have left you know, people behind where they're from. They've certainly left the land. You see Barnabas sells the land that he's left. Uh, but on the other hand, now they're, they've got this vast uh, amount that they're sharing with everyone. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of unity, love, compassion, gratitude. That's what we should be emulating right here is that pattern. Thank you so much for your kind attention and comments. <clears throat>